All right, so in the last video, we were finishing up discussing what our nature function is, right? We found out through the ontology that we're a particular substance. All particular substances have a, a matter and a form. The form is what gives us primarily our principle of motion and rest that organizes us in such a way or structures us in such a way that we can uh, fulfill our function or purpose. And we found out through a look at the four causes of all beings that for a human, the function or purpose is to exercise our rationality to become more like the unmoved mover. In this video, we will discuss what the unmoved mover is uh, and why it gives us this function. But first, I wanted to take a moment to note here a key difference from Plato. So we know that the form is what generates us, but that there's no form to study or learn about without the matter. Uh, and everything, every particular substance has a form which structures it so it can perform that function. Now, in the human, Aristotle calls this form the soul of the human. Right, so in the human, the soul is the form that organizes us so that we can use our reason to read the structure of the intelligible world. So clearly, this is going to give us a major difference from Plato. In Plato, we had a soul that was this eternal and independent thing, right? The soul existed without the body, it existed before the body, and it will exist after the body. Essentially, the soul is the real thing there, right? It can be completely separated from the body and enjoy uh, an independent existence, right? The best life is the one where you're the, the soul free from the body in contemplation of the forms according to Plato. For Aristotle, the soul is a very different thing, right? The soul is the form uh, and this acts as the cause and starting point of propagation and the other behaviors we have involved in living. But the soul does not exist before the body. The soul does not exist independent of the matter, right? The soul is what kicks off our generation, but it's the, the forming of the matter is where the soul can be found. So the soul doesn't exist before the body and then like fly from the heavens down into the world and it finds a pile of human goo and the soul flies into the goo and suddenly gives us form. No, the, the way the matter organizes is itself the form or is itself the soul. So the soul isn't this eternal or independent thing. It comes with the matter, right? When the human is organized, that's where the soul is. That's when it comes into the world. And then when the body dies and that organization falls apart, the soul is also gone now, right? The soul is the thing. It is that organization of you. So the second you lose that organization, you also lose your soul. So the body and soul for Aristotle come to exist at the same time. And so that's going to lead to a world of differences between the two. Um, it especially means that Aristotle's not going to rely on some theory of forms, right? Because the theory of forms requires that there's a soul that can gather that innate knowledge um, when it's unembodied. So Aristotle can't do that. So Aristotle's going to have to say a bunch of other stuff later on about how we can have knowledge, how we can learn things. Um, we'll get there with the process of induction. But for now, I just want you to notice this main difference in how they conceive of the soul. Okay, so here's where I promise to go in this video, right? Why do we have the nature we do? We know our nature is to be a rational animal who uses reason to look into the structure of the world. But why do we have this function, right? It's one thing to identify what the function is. Now we need to explain why we have this function. Well, first, I think an easy way to do this is to start by looking at an alternative Plato gave. So in the Timaeus, uh, this is a dialogue from Plato that we never actually got to, uh, but a very important one nonetheless. Uh, in that dialogue, Plato claims the cosmos has a divine maker. Right, so the reason uh, we are a soul that looks into uh, the realm of the forms and sits there and contemplates them, well, it's because the universe was a type of chaos and then the maker is good. Uh, and he wanted to make the universe as much like himself as possible 
and he wanted to bring into existence as much good as possible. And this is a pretty common idea when you think about God, right? God is a perfectly good being. And so if the maker is perfectly good, he's going to want to make everything else in his image, right? If this is perfect goodness, we need to emulate perfect goodness as much as we can. And we want to create a universe that can bring in to existence as much good as possible. Here's a nice quote from the Timaeus to illustrate this, right? So let us state the reason why the framer of this universe of change framed it at all. He was good, and what is good has not a particle of envy in it. Being, therefore, without envy, he wished all things to be as like himself as possible. This is the valid principle of the origin of the world of change, and we shall most surely be right to accept it from men of wisdom. Desiring, then, that all things should be good and, so far as might be, nothing imperfect, the God took over all that is visible, not at rest but in discordant and unordered motion, and brought it from disorder into order as he judged that order was better in every way. So what's another way of thinking about this? Well, think back to the argument uh, Heraclitus gave, right? that everything is in a constant state of flux. This is uh, a way of saying there's no change, remember, because there's nothing stable that's existing through that change. Right? So Plato says the divine maker comes in. He sees all of this disorder and chaos, all of this just motion occurring. And then he says, well, look, I am perfectly good and I can make all of this stuff out in the universe more like myself. And I want to do that because I'm a good being. And so I'm going to take all of this disorder and make it as ordered as I possibly can. So this gives us a craftsmanship view of teleology. In other words, the divine maker crafts us out of the disordered world in such a way that we become as much like the divine maker as we can. So here's an example of how this might work. Right? The maker in making humans gave us the ability to see so that we can see the order in nature and then come to have a mathematical understanding of that order and then come to have this abstract mathematical knowledge of order and that's a beautiful ordered unchanging thing right and then we can come to understand the order uh, within ourselves So by giving us just this sight, right, to see these structures in the world, the divine maker gave us the ability to emulate him as much as possible. But there's an issue here, and Aristotle brings this up. It's a good point, right? Both of them are trying to explain the origins of the universe, right? So Plato says, well, we have all this chaos. There's no real change uh, because it's just a bunch of stuff swirling around. There's nothing stable. And the divine maker comes in and causes the world of change to come into existence because he takes that disorder and he orders it himself. But Aristotle makes the following two points that raise issues for this notion of the divine maker. Right? Motion cannot come to be or perish, for it must always have existed, nor can time come into being or cease to be, for there could not be a before and after if it did not exist. Motion is continuous in the same way that time is, since time is either the same as movement or an attribute of it. And there's no continuous movement except motion in respect to place, specifically circular motion. There is something that's always being moved in a ceaseless motion, and this motion is circular. This is clear not only from argument, but also from what actually happens. And so the first heaven is everlasting, Hence, there's also something that initiates motion. Here's the key, key point. There's also something that initiates motion. And since whatever both is moved and initiates motion is only an intermediary, there is something that initiates motion without being moved. Something that is everlasting and substance and actuality. All right, so what's he saying here? In other words, Plato's got to be wrong. <laughs> the divine maker cannot be a craftsman because when the craftsman does stuff, right, when he takes the unordered universe and starts to craft with it, the divine maker is himself changing, 
right? If he's moving in order to create stuff, right, that movement is a form of change. And so the divine maker himself is changing. But as Aristotle said, right, if the thing is both moved and initiates motion, it's only an intermediary, right? The divine maker can't create the world of change if he himself is part of the world of change, is the main point there. So, to explain the movement or change in the universe, that's going to require something that initiates motion without itself being moved. Another way I like to think about this is roughly like the question, the infinite why questions that a child asks, right? With Plato's answer, you can still ask, well, how did that get there, right? Why does the craftsman change? What initiated the craftsman's change when the craftsman moved to craft the universe? Aristotle is trying to put an end to this chain, right? We need a being that doesn't change but can also initiate the change in the universe. That way we can explain the stable thing that's always there and how change is generated. And Aristotle comes up with the idea of this unmovable first mover. So because of the argument I was just giving, he says, the unmoved first mover of necessity exists, and insofar as it is necessary, uh, it is good and hence a starting point. On such a starting point depend the heavens and nature and its life is such as the best which we enjoy, but enjoy for a short time, for it's ever in this state which we cannot be. And thought in itself deals with which is best in itself, and thought thinks itself because it shares the nature of the object of thought, so that thought and the object of thought are the same. Now that's a mouthful, don't worry, we'll explain it. Uh, the God is always in that state in which we some things are, and life belongs to the God because the actuality of thought is life, and the God is that actuality. In other words, <laughs> right? Aristotle is saying at least, ooh, I noticed this, yeah. Aristotle saying at least the following about the unmoved first mover, right? The first mover has a perfect existence, right? We've already said it's perfectly good, uh, and so our existence is going to be good to whatever extent we can emulate or exist in that same manner. And so if this being is perfect and he's made us so that we can emulate him, well, then we're natural beings. All natural beings are going to have a particular function which allows them to become more like the first mover. Now, in these, this passage, you see all this stuff about um, the value of thought, right? Thought being the sort of ultimate end, uh, the ultimate thing of value. And so what's happening here is... The first mover is uh, unmovable, obviously, so is stable throughout all of this. So what, what is the first mover doing if it's not changing or moving? Well, it's fixed in a certain exercise of theoretical reason, right? So imagine the first mover is just this thing that's sitting there at the center of the universe that doesn't move whatsoever, and it's just sitting there thinking, it's stuck in this uh, eternal, um, eternal process of theoretical thought. And so if the first mover, if that's what makes him perfect, right, if that's what makes him so good is that he's sitting there in this eternal contemplation of theoretical wisdom, then that's going to mean there are going to be beings out there that can also function to acquire theoretical reason. Hey, it's us. We're those animals, right? We're those beings. We're the rational animals. And so because the first mover is this perfect theoretical thinker, um, we are as much like the first mover insofar as we can do that type of thinking. Now, you might say, how does the first mover move stuff, initiate change if it itself doesn't move? Well, it's because it's the object of our desire. And so a nice way of thinking about this is if you have people sitting in chairs in a circle and then you put a piece of cake in the center eventually these people are going to get up and start moving toward the cake. And so the cake is causing all of these people to move without actually moving itself. Why? Because it's the object of everybody's desire in the room. So this thing moves us as an object of desire. We want to be more like it, but itself never moves. It's perfect, sits there in theoretical thinking. And so now we finally explained why we have our final cause. Our function is to be rational because it makes us more like this first mover. And then the next 
uh, set of lectures, we will explain why or how we can gain theoretical wisdom and thus fulfill our function. Thank you.